So we're talking about what values and principles ought to guide the allocation of scarce resources. We've reviewed four values. If we eliminate first come, first serve, and sick is first, we're left with six potential principles to guide the allocation of scarce medical resources. And we propose that, in fact, five should be the core principles. Youngest first, prognosis, most lives, saving the most lives, lottery, and instrumental value. The last two principles, lottery and instrumental value, should be used only in special cases. So in our view, lottery, if used by itself, seems to be an abdication of moral judgment. We wouldn't be happy with an 80-year-old getting some life-saving treatment rather than an 8-year-old getting the same treatment. It just doesn't seem fair. It seems that the 8-year-old actually loses much more than the 80-year-old. So you might use lottery only when you have a tie between people who should get scarce resources. So we think lottery should be used only in special cases where all other things between candidates for scarce medical technologies are equal. It is a tie breaker. Similarly, social usefulness should be used in allocating scarce medical resources only in special cases. Instrumental value is really relevant only in an emergency public health kind of problem like a flu pandemic when you would give priority to doctors and nurses and other health care providers who could save more lives. You wouldn't give priority in the organ transplantation situation to someone who could be socially useful like the transplant surgeon. That's because they're not key, there's no shortage of organ transplantation surgeons, and they're not key to saving more lives. Reciprocity might take a role. We might give priority to people who've already sacrificed, who've already given up their organ, since there isn't a surplus of organ donors. Well, in some sense, that leaves us with three key principles for allocating resources. First one is begin with the priority to the youngest. They are the worst off people in some serious sense when it comes to health care. They've lived the least amount of time. They haven't had a chance to live a complete life to say live to 65 or 80 years old. A complete life, living a full life, has been the focus of ethics and justice since ancient Greece times all the way up to today. A famous philosopher has written individual human lives rather than individual experiences are the units over which any distributive principle should operate. In other words, it's a complete life that we care about, giving people the opportunity to lead a complete life. So we begin with prioritizing young people, but not starting from zero. While all deaths are tragic, it's clear that a 70-year-old has had a full life and had a chance to realize his or her goals and opportunities. A 20-year-old has the most to lose in some sense. They're just beginning to form and realize their goals and opportunities just on the cusp of living out their life. A two-year-old is largely unformed. He or she has only some personality, no formed long-term goals and aspirations, and has not cultivated his or her abilities. Two-year-old is really all unformed, uncultivated, potentiality and possibilities. On the other hand, a 20-year-old is substantially but not fully developed. He or she has long-term goals and aspirations, has spent time cultivating and studying to develop a full life. Ronald Dworkin, another famous philosopher, wrote, it's terrible when an infant dies, but worse, most people think, when a three-year-old dies, and even worse still, when an adolescent dies. And this gives us the intuition that while we want youngest first, it's not to begin at zero. In fact, an adolescent and young adult who have developed plans and attachments to the future, they've cultivated themselves. Those are the people that should receive the most priority. So you might say that priority should go like this curve. It should increase from the youngest, hit its top at about 15, and stay at the top till about 40 and then slowly decline as people are increasingly living close to a complete life. But complete lives just doesn't rely on one principle. It's complete because it includes all the morally relevant principles. 
We have this modified youngest first principle, giving priority to the adolescents and young adults. But we also want to people to live a complete life, to co live till 65, 75, or 80. And therefore, we want to have people who have the greatest prognosis to get the medical treatments. Similarly, we, whenever we can save two people, it's better to save two people rather than one, as long as we give priority to the youngest first and people with a long prognosis. And as I mentioned, we only introduce lottery when there are otherwise close ties, and instrumental value comes into effect only during public health emergencies, not for routine things like organs for transplantation. Well, there have been some objections to this complete lives account that emphasizes the youngest first prognosis and saving the most lives. One comes from this article in 2010 that asks, what happens when principles conflict? For example, prognosis conflicts with saving the most lives. Here they imagine, let's say we have three patients who will die unless they receive an organ. All are the same age, 18. One patient needs a heart and lung set. One patient would get the heart. One patient would get the lung. Now the patient, number one, who gets both the heart and lung has a chance to live 70 years. So that would emphasize the prognosis principle. Patients two and three, one would receive the heart, one would re receive the lung, but at most they would get 20 years each. That would save the most lives. Which one should we allocate according to the complete lives account? Patient one who gets 70 years, but it's only one patient, or patients two and three who each get one organ, but live 20 years each? Well, it seems pretty clear that the complete lives account would emphasize prognosis. Patient one, while fewer than patient two and three, would live substantially lo longer, 70 years. And in this case, prognosis should take rank over saving the most lives. Another objection is what happens when prognosis conflicts with youngest first. Say we have a flu pandemic. We have one dose of medication. We could treat the five-year-old who would live, we could treat the 20-year-old who would live five more years, or we could treat the two-year-old who would live 80 more years. How would the complete lives take this into account? Now recognize that patient one, the 20-year-old, would not lead a complete life. It would be five additional years, but not a complete life. Whereas the two-year-old would lead a complete life with the additional uh, medication. In this case, it seems pretty clear that the complete lives would emphasize the two-year-old because the two-year-old alone could lead a complete life. So we've seen a couple of cases where principles might conflict and how the complete lives account would play them out. Let's review. We have four values that we want to incorporate in allocating resources. Promoting equality, giving priority to people who are worst off, maximizing benefits, and promoting social usefulness. Under each, there are two principles. So there are two ways to promote equality, lottery or first come, first serve. There are two ways to maximize or to benefit people who are the worst off. Give the organ to the sickest first or to the youngest first because the sickest first can be worse off at a moment. Youngest first tend to be worse off over a lifetime. There are two ways to maximize benefits. Save the most people or save people who are going to live the longest by prognosis. And finally, there are two ways to implement promoting social usefulness. We could be backward looking, emphasize reciprocity, people who've already made a sacrifice get priority. Or we could be forward looking, people who are going to help in the future and therefore are instrumentally valuable. We've mentioned that two of these principles should not be used. First come, first serve, because it's heavily biased towards the well-connected and people who know how to manipulate the system. And sick is first, because it looks at only at a moment when someone's sick, rather than over a complete lifetime, which seems to be the correct unit of analysis. The complete lives account is complete in the sense that it accounts for most of our intuitions, giving priority to young people, giving priority to people who are going to live a long time, and giving priority to more, saving more people than few. As set out, the complete life system is intended to guide rationing decisions, not resource allocation. It's intended to guide decisions around absolutely scarce resources, like organs for transplantation, vaccines during a flu pandemic. There is no neutral default option. 
any form of allocation is going to involve value judgments and ethical principles. We have given you one view, the Complete Lives account, which we think is the best way of incorporating all of the ideas we have about fairness in the allocation of absolutely scarce resources. Thank you.